Is that correct? 
where she has developed an international reputation as a novelist and historian. She has served as head of publications for the National Museums of Scotland and as the president of Scottish Pen. And she has also run the Edinburgh Book Festival. Her writing is prolific. It in, includes influential criticism of Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson. In fact, her 1980 biography, Robert Louis Stevenson, A Life Study, is the definitive work on the subject. She has edited poetry anthologies such as Translated Kingdoms, Scottish Poems of the Sea, and she writes fiction and poetry on her own. She may be best known for her, her series of books on the Scottish diaspora. Her most recent works include an autobiography, Not Nebuchadnezzar, and Frontier Scots. I noticed a few copies of those floating around. Uh, it's an honor to invite Jenny to the podium as tonight's plenary speaker for the conference. The title of her lecture is Sir Walter Scott Goes West, Scott's Frontier Legacy. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Collar. Well, thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, and I have some thanks as well uh, to Caroline and to the organizers of the conference for the invitation to speak here. I'm delighted to be in Laramie on this particular occasion because it allows me to bring together two long-lasting, passionate interests. At the age of five, when I started going to the movies with my big brother on Saturday afternoons in Ithaca, New York, I fell in love with westerns. At the age of 11, I pulled my first Scott novel from the collected edition on my parents' bookshelf and was hooked. The American West and Walter Scott have been with me ever since, but I never anticipated that I would have the opportunity to connect them in Laramie, Wyoming, so heartfelt thanks to all concerned. Let me begin by outlining a scenario. A young man with no frontier experience makes a journey into wild and beautiful country where he negotiates difficult terrain and encounters hostile natives whose language he does not speak. He's accompanied by an older man who has some knowledge of both the territory and its people and ideas about how to exploit the former and tame the latter. There are clashes and pursuits. The native's leader is captured and escapes by leaping into a turbulent river. The young hero is impressed by the landscape and sympathetic to the native people. But the message is that the frontier and its way of life are inevitably coming to an end. He returns to the life which he knows will ultimately prevail. With a last look back at the native chieftain, skylined on a rocky crag, his feathers lifting in the wind. This is not, as I'm sure you've realized, the plot of a western, something by A.B. Guthrie, perhaps, note the Scottish name, or Jack Schaefer. Guthrie wrote the screenplay based on Schaefer's story, Shane, in which the young hero is called Robert McPherson Sterrett. It is, of course, Walter Scott's Rob Roy. The novel is set in the early 18th century, a time when beyond the Highland line, there were virtually no roads and the Highlands were, re were regarded by lowlanders as the hostile habitat of a primitive people who spoke a barbaric language. In Rob Roy, Scott describes Frank Osbaldiston's first sight of Highlanders, not in their native environment, but on the streets of Glasgow. <laughs> 
hordes of wild, shaggy, dwarfish cattle and ponies, conducted by Highlanders as wild, as shaggy, and sometimes as dwarfish as the animals they had in charge, often traversed the streets of Glasgow. Strangers gazed with surprise on the antique and fantastic dress and listened to the unknown and dissonant sounds of their language, while the mountaineers, armed even while engaged in this peaceful occupation with musket and pistol, sword, dagger, and target, stared with astonishment on the articles of luxury which they knew not the use, and with an avidity which seemed somewhat alarming on the articles which they knew and valued. In 1832, Washington Irving, the son of an immigrant from Chaponsay in Orkney, embarked on an expedition to what was then the American Far West. Irving had been in Scotland, and indeed had visited Scott in Abbotsford. In a tour of the prairies, his account of his Western adventure, he passed through the boom town of St. Louis, jumping off point on the Mississippi for travelers heading west. He wrote, here were to be seen about the river banks the hectoring, extravagant, bragging boatmen of the Mississippi, the gay, grimacing, singing, good-humored Canadian voyageur, vagrant Indians of various tribes loitered about the streets, now and then a stark Kentuckian hunter in leather, leathern hunting dress with rifle on shoulder and knife in belt strode along. In Rob Roy, Bailey Nicol Jarvie predicts that Glasgow will be transformed by tobacco and sugar shipped in from the New World. The transformation was already underway, and the evidence is still much apparent in Glasgow today. Over a hundred years later, St. Louis was moving fast on the proceeds of the fur trade and anticipation of the exploitation of the Far West. New houses were going up, and shops opened by, quote, bustling, driving, eager men from the Atlantic states, contrasting with the earlier French mansions and the, quote, easy, indolent air of the original colonists. Both Glasgow and St. Louis were, in a sense, new world cities. Both were connected by water to distant territories. Glasgow's River Clyde was the highway to the Atlantic and America and also a crucial link to the West Highlands. The Mississippi was the route to America's frontier territories, as well as connecting the North with the South and the Gulf of Mexico. Both cities were places of transience, of the mingling of strange peoples and diverse languages, including, in both cities, Gaelic speakers, where Scottish Highlanders were prominent in the North American fur trade. Both cities were emblems of departure and arrival, of journeys made or about to be made, of people and goods in transit. Most of Scott's novels feature journeys, actual and metaphorical. Scotland is a geographically small country fragmented by mountains, rivers, and lochs. It includes hundreds of islands and skerries, wild seas, formidable cliffs, treacherous quicksands and mudflats. Rooted in Scots Scottish fiction is the understanding that you can only connect up the fragments by making journeys, and that these journeys necessitate overcoming huge obstacles, both topographical and cultural. Scotland's history itself has extraordinary mobility. Don't be misled when you see Edinburgh's splendid castle atop its volcanic rock, into thinking that Edinburgh was always the seat of power. Over the centuries, there were plenty of alternatives, from windswept Finlagen on the island of Isla, center of the Lordship of the Isles, to elegant Falkland Palace in Fife, built by James IV and James V. Over and over again, Scott, in his poetic narratives as well as his fiction, employs the trope of a journey into unknown territory to illuminate difference 
and to explore at least the possibility of connection, out of which can come regeneration. His novels are full of wanderers, maverick nomads, as well as curious gentlemen, outlaws like Rob Roy, rebels like Fergus MacIver, misfits like Balfour of Burley. Apparently, random travels intersect with those with purposeful destinations. And those destinations vary in direction and character. London, Galloway and the Solway Firth, the northeast coast, as well as the Highlands, and of course, the city of Edinburgh. Later Scottish writers would take up the theme of mobility. Stevenson, Margaret Oliphant, Hugh Miller, Neil Munro, John Buchan. And it continues in contemporary fiction Read James Robertson's And the Land Lay Still, published last year, for a recent example that echoes Scott in more ways than one. If you take on the task of writing about small, disconnected Scotland, you cannot stay in one place. The only way to make sense is to be on the move. Scott did not invent the road novel, but by rooting it in Scotland's past, he injected it with new life and new purpose. He also provided a narrative model for a new country, founded on journeys and a belief in progression, outward and upward. America's people, including those in occupation when the first Europeans arrived, came originally from elsewhere, as of course, Scotland's and indeed all of Europe's people. More importantly, the settlement of America depended on journeys into the interior, into unknown territory inhabited by strange peoples who had widely varying material cultures and spoke many different languages. Many of these peoples lived nomadic lives. Without journeys, there could be no America and no American narrative. In the context of Scottish experience, that narrative was constructed, first of all, by Scots who described their travels in the New World and by those with a keen eye for economic potential and the possibilities of settlement. Given the opportunity, Bailey Nicol Jarvie could well have been one of them. Settlement, as John Galt examines in his frontier novels Laurie Todd and Bogle Corbett, is about more than survival and subsistence. It's about defeating wilderness and laying the foundations for progress. It was almost inevitable that the first American novelist of westward expansion, James Fenimore Cooper, should look to Scott for guidance. Scott's work had crossed the Atlantic with great speed and was received with extraordinary enthusiasm. Andrew Hook has detailed the American response to Scott, highlighting the importance of its Scottishness that is, not English, not associated with a colonial inheritance. Although, of course, Scotland provided large numbers of soldiers for the imperialist army, and Scots were much disliked in some quarters for their commercial success, especially in the tobacco trade. Scottish writers, but Scott above all, had demonstrated that a small nation with a larger, more powerful neighbor could have a distinctive literature that spoke to the world. For a new nation, determined to establish its own cultural identity, Scott was an inspiration. His narratives also provided an example of how a developing country could accommodate the frontier and absorb the frontier experience into heroic tales underpinned by both romance and loss. Like Rob Roy on his frontier mountainside, Natty Bumpo in his final incarnation in the prairie is an anachronism, an old man dressed in skins, quote, a pouch and horn suspended from his shoulders, leaning on a rifle of uncommon length, but which, like its owner, exhibited the wear of long and hard service. He has one last task to perform, which facilitates exactly the progress which will make him redundant. Among his inheritors is A.B. Guthrie's Dick Summers and the Big Sky and the Way West. 
who similarly colludes in enabling settlement which will destroy his role and also tame the wilderness, the source of both freedom and identity. The Prairie is set in 1804, the year following the Louisiana Purchase, which opened a vast swathe of the American continent to settlement from the US. In 1805, Scott's Lay of the Last Minstrel precipitated him to fame as chronicler of an apparently lost Scotland. He was addressing a readership whose interest in the wilderness beyond the Highland Line was already primed by the accounts of travelers such as Robert Pennant and the dynamic duo James Boswell and Samuel Johnson, and most of all by the oceanic tales of James McPherson. In the 1770s, Highland Scotland was being discovered by Englishmen and Lowland Scots alike, while on the other side of the Atlantic, a war was being fought that would have huge repercussions for Scotland. Scots fought on both sides in the War of Independence. Scotland's trade and industry were profoundly affected by it, and the creation of the USA had consequences for Scotland's population that are still being felt today. By the time Scott was being published, there was a burgeoning Scottish interest in the still infant United States with frequent articles in the press and the appearance of dozens of books of travelers' tales and advice to emigrants. In November 1812, a party of seven men were making their way down the Sweetwater River. They were led by a Scottish Highlander called Robert Stewart and included two other Scots, Robert McClellan and Ramsay Crooks. They had come from Astoria, the fur trading post on the Pacific coast, and were the first white men to traverse South Pass through the Rockies, not very far away from here, the route that would become, three or four decades later, trodden by thousands, making their way to Oregon and California. Stuart and his men followed the sweet water to the North Platte, passing not far north of here, pausing where, 20 or so years later, Fort Laramie would be constructed by William Sublette and another Scot, Robert Campbell. Ten months after setting off from the Pacific coast, they arrived at St. in St. Louis. It took another two months for Stuart to reach his final destination, New York. It was an epic journey from a bleak outpost near the mouth of the Columbia River to Manhattan, where John Jacob Astor presided over his fur trading empire. And Stuart brought the news that there was a route west that could be negotiated by wagons, not just on foot or on horseback. It was perhaps now possible to think of bringing together East and West. At that time, there were still few roads north of Scotland's Highland Line. Although communications were improving, many parts of the North and West Highlands were still only accessible on foot or horseback or by boat. When Waverley was published in 1814, many parts of the Highlands were inaccessible to those without a guide, just as they were to Edward Waverley, who marveled at Evan Dew's ability to follow without hesitation an imperceptible track. The Highlands, like America west of the Mississippi, were still very much in the process of being discovered. Scott, of course, would speed up the process which would be further accelerated by Queen Victoria's enthusiasm for all things Highland, and accelerated even more by steam and the railways. The 1840s, the decade which brought Victoria to Scotland and the royal acquisition of Balmoral on Deeside, was the decade that saw thousands of covered wagons make their way west from the Missouri to the Pacific. It was, on both sides of the Atlantic, a decade of myth-making. Scott 
of course, was dead, but Balmorality built on his legacy, Victoria was reading The Lady of the Lake as she set foot on Highland Hills. Scott did not just describe landscape, he evoked a life that was organic to it and the intimacy of the natives' relations with it. Rob Roy and Evan Dew are part of their environment, not imposed upon it. Clan structure, feudal and territorial, evolved and survived out of a need to subsist on unproductive land. Scott stresses the barrenness of Fergus MacIver's terrain, the scanty crops of barley ravaged by wild ponies and cattle, the half-starved dogs, a stunted birch wood, a narrow glen flanked by hills which is, quote, wild and desolate rather than grand and solitary. MacIver's ability to maintain his clan, to feed the families and command the loyalty of his fighting men, rests on activities which take him beyond the law as he exerts blackmail to protect his neighbours from the depredations of a local cattle thief. He keeps the peace. He maintains a fighting force. He is a Jacobite. In other words, both sheriff and outlaw, with striking parallels to situations found on America's frontiers. In both the Highlands and the Scottish borders, Scots' home territory, attempts to impose centralised law enforcement had been resisted for centuries. The tension between different systems of survival and the clash of loyalties informed every aspect of Scotland's history and generated examples of uncompromising independence which fed Highland and border mythology. The border ballads in which Scott was steeped celebrated the activities of reavers and outlaws. Tales of oceanic heroism cannot be separated from clan warfare, which could be as hideously violent as any American frontier savagery. Highland support for Charles Edward Stuart was a complex mix of clan loyalty and separatism. One can argue that the Jacobite army did not reach London less because of a failure of nerve than because the clansmen's main concern was the preservation of a way of life already under threat rather than replacing a monarch ruling from the south of England. The parallels with North America are not entirely coincidental. At every stage of colonial and post-colonial USA, frontier communities were distanced from central government and operated to a greater or lesser extent out with the law. Often the frontier attracted criminals and misfits. Many Scottish travelers in the US in the early decades of the 19th century commented on this. And of course, Westerns are full of escapees from convention, if not from crime, back east. Many Appalachian communities notoriously resistant to conformity and prone to family feuding were the descendants of Scots and Ulster Scots who were among the first to head west. The connections between Scottish cattle drovers and reavers and American ranchers and rustlers have been explored by Scottish author and member of the Scottish Parliament, Rob Gibson. More generally, themes that are deeply rooted in Scottish history and in much of Scots fiction emerge in the history of Americans moving frontier and in the Western. Feuding and range war, for example. The Graham Tewkesbury feud, again, note the Scottish name, played out in Arizona with echoes of border and highland theft and murder. Many of the key players in the most famous ra of range wars, the Lincoln County War in New Mexico and closer to where we are today, the Johnson County War in Mo Wyoming, were Scots or of Scottish descent. The pursuit of vengeance. Translate old mortality's Balfour of Burley to the American West, and he might be John Wayne in The Searchers, 
or Clint Eastwood in High Plains Drifter. When Eastwood's Jim Duncan, another Scottish name, rides into town, we see the name Scott on a headstone in the graveyard and the name Ross on a storefront. Perhaps it's just coincidence. The name of the intrepid 14-year-old heroine of Charles Portis's novel True Grit, recently filmed for the second time, is Matty Ross. The clash of values between independence and governance, between maverick action and progress, recurs over and over again, both in Scott's novels and in Western film and fiction. And the consequent contradictions, vigilante action, for example, violating community values in order to protect the community. In Rob Roy, Helen McGregor instructs a summary execution to protect her territory and her people. In 1892, Wyoming's ranchers, who see themselves as pillars of progress and number many Scots, bring in gunmen from out with the state to deal with rustlers. One of the iconic victims, Nick Ray, bears a name that is prevalent in Orkney. Is he a rustler or a little guy battling against big business in the shape of powerful ranch owners. The sheriff who attempts to bring justice is William Red Angus, another Scot. There are hints here of the Highland communities that resisted clearance, and an even stronger analogy with the crofting wars that were coterminous with several of the range wars. The scenario of small people being strong-armed by powerful landowners was a phenomenon Scott was well aware of. In the first decades of the 19th century, the removal of clanspeople from land to make way for lucrative sheep farming was widespread and was often initiated by those whose claim to ownership of the land owed more to tradition than legality. On the other side of the Atlantic, Native Americans were similarly cleared and land was similarly hijacked. None of this land is surveyed, said Granville Stewart, of land along the Judith River in Montana, where he started ranching in 1879, and the only way to hold it is by occupying it. Stewart was, of course, of Scottish descent. As a major rancher in the area, he was determined to stamp out rustling and organized his own vigilante group known as Stewart's Stranglers to hunt down the alleged culprits. Many of those branded as rustlers were small-scale homesteaders who were seen as a hindrance to the big ranchers' expansionist ambitions. Remember Shane, set in Wyoming, and the bullying depredations of a rancher trying to drive out the local sodbusters. As has often been commented, Scott did not in his fiction deal with troubling contemporary issues of clearance and emigration although in Guy Mannering, a local community of gypsies is cleared. His concern was to project the past, to introduce his readers to an elucidation of characters and events which he believed were in danger of being lost. But he went to great lengths to establish connections and continuity, to show through complex layers of authority that his inventions had substance and wait. American narratives of the frontier could not replicate Scott's layered approach. There, weren't, there wasn't enough of the past to draw on. But, and here I return to my opening observations, they depend heavily on journeys, actual and metaphorical, and on the greenhorn's encounter with the unknown, scopes which, tropes which Scott had made his own. Scott also offered an exploration of heroism from romantic posturing to pragmatic bravery, sometimes, as with Rob Roy, both manifested in a single character. His heroic figures, as opposed to his heroes, are often ambivalent, always anachronistic, but also bearing the weight of a complex and contentious history. <coughs> 
Edward Waverley, Frankus Bodlestons, Red Gauntlets, Darcy Latimer are free of the burden of the past. Old Mortality's Henry Morton is an interesting exception. But lo like Rob Roy, Old Mortality provides us with a dramatic finale which, with little adjustment, could become an American frontier tale. The covenanting leader, Balfour Burley, has been tracked down by troopers. He fires his pistol, killing one of the troopers and the horse of another. He then gallops off, looking for a place where he can ford the river. When he plunges his horse into the water, his pursuers fire at him. In fact, as Scott himself acknowledged, John Balfour escaped to Holland after the Battle of Bothwell Brig. This account is entirely fictitious, but is entirely consonant with Burley's character as presented by Scott. Horses feature prominently in Old Mortality. The presence of both Balfour and Claverhouse, who rides an iconic black charger, is enhanced by their steeds. A Western narrative without horses is hard to imagine. Pas de cheval, pas de cowboy, as someone said. <laughs> Balfour is a fanatic, but he is also a courageous and lonely figure, riding through wild country, not in this case the Highlands, but a part of South Lanarkshire that is, in Scott's words, nothing but heath and rock. Morton finds Balfour holed up in a cave beneath a waterfall. The water plunges into, quote, a deep, black, yawning gulf. All that can be seen is, quote, one sheet of foaming uproar and sheer descent until the view was obstructed by the projecting crags which enclosed the bottom of the waterfall and hid from sight the dark pool which received its tortured waters. In this extreme environment, Balfour enacts his own misguided extremism. Print the legend, says the newspaper man in John Ford's The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Create the legend, Scott might have replied. <laughs> Scott's interpretation of, char of character is inseparable from landscape, which either informs personality or highlights its incompatibility. In the same way, in narratives of the American West, landscape is an integral part of both character and action. Remove the landscape, whether the rolling prairies crossed by wagon trains and cattle drives, iconic Monument Valley favored by John Ford, the Rocky Mountains that are both dramatic backdrop and threatening barrier, the deserts and badlands, and the very substance of heroic action melts away. At the same time, wild land breeds wild people. Not just natives, conventionally described as wild Indians, but an array of misfits and renegades and opportunists. The conquest of wilderness, and equally important, the inherent, almost visceral relationship between the wild and the urban is an essential part of the American narrative. John Buchan said of Scott that he is equally at home in the city and in the wilds. With this apparently simple statement, Buchan reminds us of Scott's extraordinary ability to hold in focus both the metropolitan and the marginal and to examine their intimacy. The Bride of Lammermoor is a good example. Here is another scenario. An army colonel returns from the Indian Wars, wanting to settle somewhere peaceful and remote from society. He heads for frontier country. He encounters outlaws and land grabbers. Communities have been displaced. The arm of the law is exceeding short, and vigilantism is common. A small boy is spirited away, stolen, it is believed, by a nomadic tribe. People move on foot and on horseback on lonely trails through bandit-ridden country. The colonel's home is attacked. Two younger men in different ways prove their courage and steadfastness. A dodgy lawyer does deals with a criminal with a foreign accent 
no prizes for identifying this as Guy Mannering or for detecting elements that appear in countless Westerns. The frontier where Guy Mannering makes his home is not the wild country beyond the Highland line, but the Scottish borders. In his fiction, Scott identifies as no other the way topography shapes people and history. A small country, despite Hugh McDermott's question mark, not quite surrounded by water, again echoing McDermott, with two frontiers that are porous, mutable, and dangerous. Nature, Scott says in Guy Mannering of the border country, as if she had designed this tract of country to be the barrier between two hostile nations, has stamped upon it a character of wildness and desolation. The people share that character, quote, partly from their own habits, partly from their intermixture with vagrants and criminals who make this wild country a refuge from justice. Like America's shifting border frontier country, the Appalachians, the Trans-Mississippi West, the, then the Trans-Missouri West, the borderlands attract those who cannot or will not fit the requirements of conventional society. In true grit, Indian territory across the Arkansas border is the place of refuge for the, murder, the murderer of Matty Ross's father beyond the reach of the jurisdiction of Fort Smith. Matty herself, like so many of Scott's heroes, makes a journey into the unknown in the company of experienced, if not altogether reliable, guides. Guy Mannering's Bertram is guided by borderer Dandy Dinmont. As they make their way north from Cumberland, there is nothing to denote where England ends and Scotland begins. But Dandy, quote, aided by the sagacity of his horse, is able, like Evan Dew, to pick a route through the difficult terrain. Outlaws lurk in the hills and materialize from the Solway Firth and its treacherous coastline. Scott is picturing a society that is emerging from lawlessness, and the forces that enable that transition are a combination of honest men of, of law and heroic men of action who operate, if not out with the law, out with a conventional social infrastructure. Guy Mannering and Henry Bertram are military men who have fought hostiles in India. Dandy Dinmont is a native of the hills, a man of integrity and self-reliance. The lawyer Playdell is an honest eccentric. Together they face greed, weakness and corruption and prevail. Meg Merrilies, the misfit whose community has been destroyed and whose role throughout has been pivotal, cannot survive. She is the link between the lawless frontier and the regulated society to come. But in the new order, there is no place for her. A repeated theme in American frontier narratives underlines the paradox of the pioneering hero who renders himself redundant by enabling the building of an ordered community. Natty Bumpo is pushed further and further west by encroaching settlement. A.B. Guthrie's Dick Summers knows that through his own actions, he is helping to bring an end to a way of life he loves. He guides the wagon trains that signal the beginning of the end of the frontier. His young companion, Boone Cordell, incidentally a version of the Scottish name Caldwell, is confident that the fur trapper's life, quote, free and easy, with time all a man's own and none to say no to him, will not end soon. Not so soon a body had to look ahead and figure what to do with the beaver gone and churches and courthouses and such standing where he used to stand all alone. The country was too wild and cold for settlers. He's talking about Wyoming. <laughs> but Boone is wrong. And like Meg Merrilies, there is no place for mountain men among the new communities constructing as rapidly as they can 
the civic institutions that represent respectability and security. Shane rides in out of nowhere, rescues a community under threat from a greedy and unscrupulous local rancher, and rides on. There is no place for him in the secure environment brought by his heroic actions. But a small boy will forever have his image imprinted on his mind. The frontier will close officially in 1890, but will live on in the imagination and will be reenacted over and over again. A hundred years earlier, the Scottish borders and the Scottish highlands were largely tamed, but the resonance of their past continued. Scott's narratives and his recapture of oral tradition demonstrated that moving on from the past did not require losing it. He offered image after image, which, like Shane, linger in the national consciousness. It was in the year before Walter Scott was born that David Hume wrote in a letter to William Strachan, I believe that this is the historical age and this the historical nation. Scott picked up that baton and furnished Scotland's past with a narrative that connected it with the present. America was perceived as being without a deep past to provide ballast for the future. America's history was forged out of space rather than time. And this takes us back to journeys. As with Scotland, to create a narrative out of American history without journeys is inconceivable. In Larry McMurtry's novel, Lonesome Dove, two former Texas Rangers, Woodrow Call and Augustus McRae, the first Scottish-born, the second of Scottish descent, as is McMurtry himself, drive a herd of cattle from the Mexican border to the Milk River near the Canadian border. McRae is flamboyant and easygoing, cold, hardworking, and single-minded. There is no overt evocation of a Calvinist inheritance, but it is there nevertheless, as are the echoes of David Balfour and Alan Breck Stewart in Stevenson's Kidnapped. With Cole and McRae is a motley crew of misfits, displaced characters as uncertain of their origins as of their destination. The two and a half thousand mile epic journey takes the protagonists from the heat and aridity of Texas to the lush grasslands and severe winters of Montana. The rivers they cross, the Red, the Canadian, the Arkansas, the Republican, the Platte, are the territorial markers of their journey north. There are struggles and violent encounters, mishaps, diversions, and loss, but they doggedly continue. The south-north trek becomes not an emblem of pioneering settlement like the way west, but an odyssey almost for its own sake. Most of the characters in McMurtry's novel, women as well as men, feel impelled to be on the move even when they are homesick for Tennessee, for Texas, for a dimly remembered and perhaps illusional way of life. They are lured by prospects of whiskey, free grass, available women, not generally free, a good horse. <laughs> but the journey is also a connection or a series of connections, linking places and lives and experiences, helping to give definition to a vast and inchoate territory which appears to resist all notions of conventional order. Part of that definition is the movement itself. McMurtry's Woodrow Call returns to Texas, not to put down roots, but to continue his restless tracking down of threats to community building. Like the westward moving frontier, this movement demands a narrative. Narrative gives the developing nation its history. In very different circumstances, the same thing began to happen in Scotland in the second half of the 18th century. The recognition of the need for an inclusive narrative. It was, above all, 
Walter Scott, who responded to that need. Scott's wanderers and misfits tend not to survive. They fall away to make room for a new Scotland. There seems not to be sufficient hinterland, territorial or psychological, to absorb them, which leaves only death or exile for those who cannot join the march of progress. And exile does indeed become part of the Scottish narrative, and exiled Scots in their turn, as I've suggested, contribute strikingly to the North American narrative. But Scotland's wanderers and misfits do not vanish. They reappear with Stevenson and others and are very present in the work of contemporary writers today. An awareness of the new world and its potential as a source of analogy and of expanding the national narrative is both implicit, implicit and explicit in Scott. Later writers would explore this potential. The journey of Larry McMurtry's Hat Creek outfit ends at the Milk River where they establish a ranch. On the way north, Gus McRae has reconnected with a former sweetheart with a Scottish name, Clara Forsyth, who reads Scott's novels. In the TV version of this tale, the neighboring rancher in Montana is another Scot who does his best to discourage the newcomers from encroaching on what he considers to be his cattle range. His ranch is called Kenilworth, and he's partial to single malt whiskey. The frontier legacy of Walter Scott continues. Thank you. in the United States has, has for so long been so much more strongly recognized. Uh, there's much more awareness of, uh, of, of the Irish and the, and, and the Irish story. Um, in fact, just recently there seems to be a rash of fiction about Irish immigration to the US. It, it's, it's taken a long time for, um, for the Scottish story to begin to have the same impact. Um, there's a nice research project for somebody in that, I'm sure. <laughs> springs to mind uh, is Isabella Bird, who she wasn't actually born in Scotland, but she spent much of her adult life in Scotland when she wasn't travelling elsewhere. Um, and she uh, travelled solo in, in the Rockies and in, uh, in Colorado. Um, just, oh, she, she travelled, she took a train to Denver, I think, and then set off on her own. So and she was quite an intrepid character. So she's a she's a she's a good example. But there there, there are not very many of them. Right, um, Scott, the women, I think the journey of her, so Jean Jean Deans, it was from the frontier right down. Yes, yeah, to the centre of power. Yes, um, but there are not very many uh, in, in Scott's novels. The the uh, 
You can count on the fingers of one hand, probably, <coughs> strong female characters. Is that, in the West, Western has been hijacked by other genres. Um, I would like to think that there's still life in it yet. Um, and there's certainly, um, I just recently read uh, something that you couldn't really describe as a Western, I suppose, but it seems to me to owe a great deal to the Western genre, and certainly to the whole sort of frontier genre, and that's Winter's Bone by Daniel Woodrow. Uh, which is, has been made into a, 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 an excellent movie, um, and which incident is set in the Ozarks, and, uh, which, which has a strong uh, Scots and Irish heritage. Um, so uh, you know, maybe maybe there's potential there for for, for looking at the Western in a, uh, in a rather oblique fashion. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm I think that it deserves re-examining. Um, I think there are, um, if you start looking at uh, the, the history of the West, there are so many untold stories. Um, some adventurous fiction writer out there should be doing something with them. Thank you.